Directing a documentary might seem like an oxymoron. Aren't you supposed to be just an observer, a fly on the wall? Well, that fairy tale approach might work in the jungle somewhere, but in the world of corporate filmmaking is just a no-go. Very few companies are going to tolerate you hanging around for weeks waiting for story to emerge. And even fewer will be willing to pay you for it. The client wants to know what they'll get, when they'll get it and what will it take on their part. And they want to know it before they commit to the project. That is why you need to go in with a game plan. And that is what directing is all about. <laughs> The first order of business is of course to sell your client on the idea of making a film. And I've covered this first step in great detail in the video right here. So let's assume you've already gotten client's agreement on the general idea for a film. To close the deal you are going to need to create some kind of formal document, a proposal that contains three things. First, a script vision. This is a rough description of what the film is all about. Who is the hero? What do they want? What's the struggle? And how it ends. Basically a logline. But keep in mind that you are not dealing with filmmakers. You're not dealing with morons here. So you'll need to sprinkle in some explainers along the way. So it's going to be a little longer than a logline, maybe half a page. Ideally, you should also come up with a great title. But don't stress it, since the film might change drastically in the process. The second part of a proposal is a shooting schedule. A rough outline of who, where and when you'll need to shoot to achieve the script vision. This is especially important to your client, because arranging and scheduling people and locations is going to fall mostly on them. Just make sure to put the interviews, especially the main hero interviews, ahead of everything else in the schedule. And we'll talk about why in a minute. The third part is of course the budget estimate. Now budgeting is a huge topic that deserves a whole video by itself. It's mostly a producer's responsibility, but as a freelance filmmaker, budgeting falls on you at least partially. And even if you have a producer on board, they'll still ask you a thousand questions to understand the scope of the project. Ok, in brief, you should build two budgets. The first one is for yourself, so you have a pretty realistic estimate of how much it's going to cost you to make the film. As if you had to outsource it completely and pay for every job and rent every piece of gear. Then round up the total and double it. And that's the budget for your client. Wait, a 50% profit margin? Isn't that a little steep? No, it isn't. Not even close. Because in filmmaking things can and will go wrong. And guess who will be covering the additional expenses? That's right, you. All the risks are on you. So if you double the projected costs, at least you'll break even if the whole thing turns into a complete shit show. So in the worst case scenario, at least you won't lose any money. There's a dozen more reasons to double the costs, but like I said, that's out of scope for this video. And that's your proposal. Now, you clearly need to communicate to your client that the story of the film will change drastically based on how the hero interviews will go. As a result, you might need to switch some locations or talk to additional people. So the shooting schedule might change, but the overall number of shooting days should stay the same. And if you're smart, you've budgeted in a couple of extra shooting days, just in case. Now, if they push you on price, you need to propose reductions in the film's scope. Basically, your response should mean we can't realize this vision for less, but we can lessen the vision. So any budget cuts should come from locations and shooting days, not from your pocket. Hopefully after some back and forth, they give you the green light on the final proposal. A contract is signed and the advance fee is received and it's time for you to go to work. That has got to go to work. Even though you've already put in a bunch of work for free. As you switch into production mode, the first important step is to conduct your hero interviews. Because interviews are going to be the storytelling vehicle of your film. 
Now, of course, there's this uh, show don't tell ideal that you should strive towards, but realistically, you'll be working with non actors, ordinary, and let's face it, sometimes pretty boring people. So don't expect them to break down in tears or put on a comedy show. So it's on you to make them sound interesting by asking interesting questions. And that's where directing starts to really kick in. Based on the research you've done beforehand and the script vision you pitched, it should be no problem to come up with questions for the interviews. On our most recent film, we had three heroes or heroines. Heroines? Heroines. So we took an extra step we sent out a questionnaire asking them a few things. What's their area of expertise? What would they like to talk about on camera? Who would they recommend we talk to about them? And if there are any bucket list items that they would like to do specifically on camera for the film. And that gave us some interesting ideas. For example, we found out that one of our heroines owns a boxing club, which became a thematic location for an interview. Some ideas didn't pan out though. For example, the other heroine told us that she would do a parachute jump. And I thought, great, I'll ask her about her innermost fears and she'll be all vulnerable. And in the end, she will face her fears by taking a literal leap of faith out of a flying airplane. And that idea completely flopped. She turned out to be a fearless go-getter type and didn't show any vulnerability whatsoever. She did, however, go into an unexpected rabbit hole about family traditions and passing down family values through generations. So we scrapped the parachute idea and did a cozy, intimate shoot in her house instead. And that is exactly why you should conduct your hero interviews before shooting anything else. So you have room to maneuver when some of your inquiries don't yield interesting responses. Or vice versa, some of the themes you didn't plan for pop up. The last issue on this topic is whether to send out questions beforehand. And the answer is no, don't send out a list of questions. The absolute last thing that you want to hear in a film is some PRBS corpo speak that they prepared in advance. On the other hand, it's beneficial to you to let them know in advance, in general terms, what are you going to question them about and what do you expect to get from the interview. So it's a good idea to send out some kind of primer or do a short pre-interview over the phone. Also try to use this opportunity to put them at ease. Reassure them that it is not some kind of interrogation and that you'll just be there to have a little chat. And that probably only 10% of it will end up in the final movie. That should relax them a bit. Now, when you've got your interview questions ready, there are two things to consider. Who is going to be conducting the interview and where is it going to take place? The question of who boils down to two options. It's either going to be you or a hired professional interviewer. And if I'm being honest, it really should be you. When making my first documentary, I thought, hey, I'm an introvert. Soft skills are really not my forte. Plus, I'm going to be minding the camera, the lighting, the audio. I got my plate full, so I should probably outsource this. And almost immediately I regretted it. Not because the interviewer did a bad job, no. It's just, as I was listening, I realized that no one could do this better than me. Because only I know what I'm trying to get from this interview. As I'm listening, I'm editing in my head, deciding which paths are worth going down and which questions should be scrapped. This was directing and it was actually the camera stuff that I needed to outsource. Something to think about. Now, the question of where is just as important. I'm always pushing for a thematic location, not just a blank studio. Because location choice should communicate something about the hero, what they stand for, what makes them interesting. And of course, a thematic location provides a great opportunity to shoot some interesting B-roll. And this also doubles as a scheduling trick. These people are busy and you should film as much stuff as you can when you get a hold of them. It's much easier to book more time on the same day than to schedule a separate filming day. And if you've chosen a thematic location, just make sure they actually talk about it. Because if your hero is sitting in a skate shop and never even mentions skateboarding, that's gonna be mighty weird. 
Okay, so now you are done with interviews and if you're anything like me, you're in a state of total panic. Nothing has gone according to the script, the interviews are total dog shit and the film is dead. Breathe out, take a chill pill and consider this. If you don't get physically ill seeing your first rough cut, something's wrong. Hey, if Marty Scorsese still feels this way, then it's okay for you to feel this way too. What you need to do right now is to tell the client that the interviews were terrific, that you are very excited to get to work on them and that they should expect a final synopsis from you next week. Now load up your editing software and do an interview string out and markdown. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about right now, watch my video about corporate documentary editing workflow. The goal at this stage is to go through your interviews and chop them down into tiny Lego pieces that you can use to assemble a rough storyline. How did you put it? Huh? Tiny pieces. See you in the morning, Ellie. Using just the interviews, tell a complete story with a beginning, a middle and an end. And that will make it abundantly clear to you what works, what doesn't work, and most importantly, what the film is actually about. Most likely your initial concept will change significantly, but that's okay, we planned for it. We also didn't yet shoot any specific B-roll because we didn't know what we would need. But now we do, so start making a list of scenes that you need to shoot to make the whole thing work. And of course, plan for enough B-roll to thoroughly cover the talking head parts. You are also likely to come up with ideas for interviews with secondary characters to provide another perspective on some storylines that emerged in the main interviews. When you're done with the rough story edit, for the love of God, don't send it to the client. Instead, update the document that you pitched with. Turn your proposed logline into a detailed synopsis, basically retelling the edit that you've made in words. And turn your rough shooting schedule into a concrete one, with locations and people and actions that need to be filmed. When you are done, this document will reflect pretty closely the final shape of your film. And when it is approved, make it clear that this is a point of no return. There will be no letters and changing of minds and new ideas after this point. What's on the page is the film. Before sending over the final concept, what I like to do is edit a short teaser from the spicy sound bites and the best shots we've made so far. Try to convey in a minute or less the vibe of the film. And of course, use this opportunity to show off some of your skills. This teaser should make them excited and more eager to work on the scheduling and generally kick them into filmmaking gear. Because corporate filmmaking is a two-way street. You need someone on the client's side to rally the troops, so to speak, and to be a hype man for the project. And a great teaser makes this job much easier. The rest of the production period should be relatively painless and a great time to flex your creative muscles and shoot some real bangers. At this point you'll be mighty glad you over budgeted, because you'll be burning through money much faster than you expected. The artist and the businessman in you are going to have some tough conversations. But in the end this stage is the most fun and will feel easy because you've already done your prep work and you just need to execute. And after you've wrapped your final shooting day, it's time to board the train headed straight to editing hell. Oh, oh. Which can be totally avoided if you just follow my advice from this video. As you can see, the process of corporate filmmaking is trying to harness the chaos. Clients want to know what they'll get before they commit to it. And you have no idea what you'll get because a documentary is made in the edit. But filmmaking is intrinsically uncertain and you almost never get what you imagined. The more structure, the more clarity and predictability you can bring to the process, the happier your clients will be and the less stressed you yourself will be. Go in with the game plan, 
plan for uncertainty and be ready to improvise. But remember, the quality of the final product is not the whole story. The journey there is equally as important. Sure, clients can tell a garbage film from a good film, but they can't tell a good film from a great one. So get a handle on your perfectionism and serve the client first and foremost. So make it a fun ride for them by explaining what's gonna happen, when it's gonna happen and why, and explain everything that seems obvious to you. Stay in constant communication, don't be a drama queen, and if you do this part right, they are all but guaranteed to love the final cut and become your clients for life. And that about does it. Check out other videos in this series if you haven't already, and let me know down in the comments what topic I should cover next. And that's all I got for today, so I'll see you around the tubes.